And if one is going to be a thyroid surgeon, probably it's wise to know how to do all aspects of these operations. You don't want your airline pilot to be really good 90% of the time, do you? Hmm. you I wouldn't get on an airplane with a gentleman that said, I can handle 90% of the problems while we're flying. And so you really, it's the one beautiful thing of this disease is very few people die from it. But it, you need to learn to listen to patients uh, and tailor the care to each patient. So <clears throat> if you are appropriately aggressive and understand your anatomy, then it, you would rarely ever cut the recurrent laryngeal nerve and then have to leave thyroid cancer behind. I'm going to write a paper someday called The Evil Remnant. And that's when someone has left a centimeter of thyroid behind and papillary thyroid cancer, and then it starts growing again two years later, because we've wasted so much money evaluating thyroids over the years and operating on thyroids that didn't need to come out. Hello and welcome. This is Philip James with Dr. Thyroid. You are hearing excerpts from today's interview with Dr. James Netterville from Vanderbilt University. This episode is a must-listen for patients and doctors alike. Today, we are covering important topics such as remnant thyroid cancer, that would be thyroid cancer left behind after a thyroidectomy, vocal cord paralysis, and avoiding unskilled surgeons. Dr. Netterville uses the utmost caution when operating, an assumption that all surgeons do so, but the fact is a surgeon only knows what he or she knows. We'll get to this in more detail shortly. Dr. Netterville has performed thousands, literally, of thyroidectomies, including that of a well-published case of singer Natalie Grant. So in this interview, we'll be talking about preserving the voice and the vocal cord uh, during thyroid surgery. Before we get started, a few exciting updates about Dr. Thyroid. Due to many requests, now Dr. Thyroid is available in Spanish exclusively on its own website, and that is doctyroides.com. And Dr. Thyroid is now listened to in over 50 countries, with some episodes receiving as many as 30,000 downloads. The power of podcasts is growing, and the goal of Dr. Thyroid is to empower patients with the information needed to make as good as medical decisions as possible related to thyroid cancer and thyroid disease. One more thing, in this interview, we will not only be talking in detail about the topic, but we will also hear Dr. Netterville touch base on the power of social media and the role it is playing in healthcare and the reputation of doctors. On that note, Dr. Thyroid is on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Recently, I have chosen to publish some uncomfortable yet candid topics related to thyroid cancer. This information has been popular with patients, not so popular with some doctors. As you will hear today, not all surgeons are good. Errors related to thyroid surgery should not happen. Hopefully, if you are a patient, you listen to this interview and others and go into your surgery knowing what to expect and knowing that your vocal cord should not be paralyzed. There should be no calcium impairment due to parathyroid damage, and no remnant cancer should be left behind after a thyroidectomy. Now, to get started, Dr. Netterville is the Director of Head and Neck Surgery at Vanderbilt and is an international leading authority of treating head and neck cancer. He is one of the world's experts in the treatment of school-based tumors and has a vast clinical experience. Dr. Netterville, welcome. If you could please share a little bit more about your background and experience. Philip, it's an honor to be on your program. You asked me to outline a little bit about my experience uh, in thyroid surgery. I am a head and neck oncologist. I'm the director of the head and neck surgical division at Vanderbilt University, where I've been for 32 years. A very significant part of any head and neck cancer surgeon's practice is thyroid. So I perform anywhere from two to five thyroidectomies per week. Many of those are revision thyroidectomies 
where they've already had surgery somewhere else and a recurrence has occurred. Uh, each of my partners do a significant volume of thyroid surgery as well. So we have a very active unit here at Vanderbilt. And today's topic is recurrence, disease, lymph nodes, preserving a patient's voice. So in the example of the digital age transforming media and the sharing of information, you have personal experience with the power of social media that many in the healthcare industry will find interesting. Let's talk about that just a minute before we get into today's topic. Please tell us more. Well, you know, people in the past, you went to the library and you checked out a book and you, and you went in the car index medicus and you found articles and you went to the library and you copied it on a copy machine and read it. And then over the last, you know, 15 years, people log online and, and look at Index Medicus again, and they look at PubMed and various sites, and they put your name in and they put a disease in and they find papers and they read them online. But it appears in the last five years that the vast majority of patients don't try to seek medical literature first. They seek advice from peers. They seek advice from other people who've had that disease for good or for bad. And so the social media sites such as Facebook have multiple disease sites now dedicated to a particular disease where thoughtful patients uh, tell their story. And so many patients find it much more comforting to read other people's stories than the medical literature itself. And so if I <clears throat> have patients that felt like I've done a good job for them, and they log online and tell their story, then the next thing you know, then other patients want to seek care from me or from the institution that's represented by those positive stories. You know, my hospital at Vanderbilt University has various plans for which they would like to market Vanderbilt University or market the good doctors that work at Vanderbilt University. And I find that those plans, you know, are not very successful on the whole now in this era. I find that the real marketing is not done by us, but done by our patients. So the better job we do, then the patients choose doctors. They don't necessarily choose institutions. They choose a care team as opposed to the institution. Now, there'll always be the, the Mayo Clinic name and the MD Anderson name and Hopkins name, folks that attract people to the institution. But even those, I see patients who have gone to each of those institutions and then looked online or talked to a Facebook group and found that one of us, me or my partners, might have more experience at Vanderbilt, and they would turn and come to us individually as opposed to coming to the institution. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, patients are not attracted blindly to an institution anymore. They're attracted to the, the data and the record and the reputation of either a doctor or that care team that doctor works with. Uh, <clears throat> and much of that is driven by social media because that's the kind of information you get more on social media than you would through the Index Medicus review of articles. No question about it. Thankfully, with the ease of sharing information online, patients can better scrutinize their care team and screen a surgeon and hopefully land in the hands of the most qualified surgeon. With that, Dr. Netterville, please share with us a little bit more about your team. Well, we have a, I have six partners and all of us treat head and neck cancer and all of us treat a significant volume of patients with thyroid cancer. Uh, thyroid cancer on the front end, if treated appropriately, as you well know, the survival rate is somewhere in the high 90%. It's how do we select out that group of patients that's not going to survive well, and how do we give them a more aggressive targeted treatment? And will they self-select to some degree when they recur, the recurrent patients? And so much of my practice is, is treating patients with recurrent thyroid disease, either recurrent in the thyroid gland itself or recurrent in the paratracheal or cervical lymph nodes. Once it is recurrent below the clavicles, 
or up in the brain, that's an entirely different non-operative disease. But uh, we concentrate on the recurrence in the paratracheal, the thyroid bed, and the cervical lymph node. So I, a significant number of patients come to me and my partners to be seen for this disease, knowing that it's critical how they're treated at this point. And are we talking about papillary thyroid cancer in this reoccurrence? <clears throat> You know, the vast majority are papillary thyroid cancer, and a significant number of those papillary thyroid carcinomas are the more aggressive subtypes, the tall cell, the hobnail versions, where these would have a more likelihood of being recurrent. We certainly see recurrence in medullary thyroid cancer, although that is a much rarer disease. You said the subtypes of papillary thyroid cancer. How does a patient know which type they have? Well, usually on the fine needle aspiration, we would, it would be difficult to tell which of the more aggressive subtypes are occurring. The vast majority of these sub are read as well-differentiated thyroid cancer or papillary thyroid cancer or less likely follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. It's usually only after we take out the disease uh, and we clinically observe the aggressiveness of the disease and then our pathologist looks at the disease that we have the, the real knowledge of whether it is one of the more aggressive subtypes, which are usually the tall cell variant, the insular variant, the hobnail variant, or sometimes even a poorly differentiated papillary thyroid. It's not anaplastic. It's a more aggressive change in the papillary itself. And is it uh, really a standard from hospitals to analyze the uh, thyroid cancer post-thyroidectomy to understand which type it is? I think it's critical that that be done. And that's where it's, it's helpful to be in a situation where the surgeons do a significant volume of thyroid disease and thyroid cancer so that you've got pathologists that are really knowledgeable and they see a high volume of it so they can really discern these unusual rare features. It's, it's not uncommon at all for us to see a patient with recurrent thyroid cancer that the primary thyroidectomy has been done in another institution by a very good surgeon. And then we, they come to us with recurrent and their thyroid better their neck. And we have the pathology brought in for read review by our very expert pathologists, and they, they see these uh, more aggressive subtypes that were not diagnosed on the outside. And so you need a pathology team that's quite experienced with this. You know, it seems to be a common theme throughout the Dr. Thyroid interviews where the emphasis on the importance of pathology it really is critical. You know, <clears throat> it's the one beautiful thing of this disease is very few people die from it. But if you do have a little more aggressive type and you do have recurrence and then another recurrence and a recurrence, it can be a significant quality burden to your life to have to continue going through this ongoing health care and multiple surgeries to try to maintain that excellent survivor. And we do know now that, you know, once we get into this group with recurrent, recurrent disease, then their survival decreases. And so an appropriate diagnosis on the front end of the appropriately aggressive surgery can make a big difference in these patients. Let's see. Walk us through, if you could. So let's say the patient goes in thyroidectomy um, for a nodule that has cancer. Um, thyroid gets removed. Uh, there's no residual cancer left behind, and then recurrence happens. <clears throat> what does that look like exactly? How does it happen? Where does it occur? <clears throat> so on and so forth. Well, we've tried to do very, very good outcome studies on these thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients to, to try to decide if they have a thyroid cancer, when should we take out lymph nodes? When should we take out paratracheal lymph nodes? When should we take out cervical lymph nodes? And when can we leave them behind? Uh, and we know on the front end that if a patient is diagnosed with a greater than one centimeter, a well-differentiated thyroid cancer, papillary or follicular, that if we do a good ultrasound of the neck, 
that the ultrasound is very accurate, far more than an MR or CT at telling us which lymph nodes might be positive. It's very difficult to do an ultrasound of the paratracheal region. Let me define that for you again. That's that distance between the trachea and the carotid and the jugular vein on both sides. So that little space of two centimeters wide by about 10 centimeters tall, the space between the carotid and jugular vein laterally and the, and the trachea medially is the paratracheal space. It's harder to do an ultrasound of that and see hidden lymph nodes when the thyroid is still in place. <clears throat> so it's very easy for us to know when to do a selective neck dissection on patients with well-differentiated thyroid cancer because the ultrasound says yes or no. <clears throat> when we go in on the thyroidectomy, then one of the goals is to remove all aspects of the thyroid and not leave a remnant behind. I'm going to write a paper someday called The Evil Remnant. It'll sound like a movie one, <laughs> The Evil Remnant. And that's when someone has left a centimeter of thyroid behind in papillary thyroid cancer, and then it starts growing again two years, three years, five years later. Then we've got to deal with this, and it's very difficult to work around the recurrent laryngeal nerve when that remnant is left. <clears throat> so at the time of the original thyroidectomy, it's a real judgment call, how many lymph nodes to take out of the paratracheal space. People that do a lot more thyroidectomies and, and treat a lot of recurrent thyroid like I do, we're a little more aggressive at taking lymph nodes out on the front end to be sure they're negative. So once we get past that and a patient comes back to us with recurrent disease, there's three areas where it recurs. And if my answers are a little long, you tell me, okay? <clears throat> One, it recurs where the remnant is left behind. The doctor is trained in a method where they don't find the recurrent laryngeal nerve. They always leave a little centimeter remnant of thyroid to protect the vascular supply of the upper parathyroid and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And that remnant can come back to, to haunt us. And we don't recommend that kind of surgery be done. The next place these recur is the hidden paratracheal lymph nodes down deep underneath the recurrent laryngeal nerve or in the upper mediastinum. And I'd say about a third of the patients I see are that remnant left behind. A third of the patients I see are the two, the lymph nodes that are now growing in the paratracheal space. And the final third is patients that come back with lymph nodes in level two, three, and four in the neck. And those levels, I think most people, even patients would understand those levels. And we just give lymph nodes in the neck level so that we can communicate in four are the lymph nodes just lateral to the jugular vein and carotid artery at the level of your thyroid. Level three are the lymph nodes a little bit higher going between what we call an omohyoid muscle and your hyoid bone. And level two are the lymph nodes that are in the superior part of your neck, all these lying along the jugular vein. So those are the three broad areas where I would see people recurring. So let's see, you talk about remnant uh, cancer, or, or that would be, say, uh, thyroid nodule left behind that has cancer. Is that correct? <clears throat> you know, it was, if, if the thyroid gland has several nodules in it that might have papillary thyroid, we'll choose well-differentiated papillary thyroid. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, as that is removed, we know that there's a chance for micro-papillary thyroid cancers to be throughout the gland. So our goal is to remove every aspect of the thyroid gland, completely follow the recurrent laryngeal nerve, dissect away the superior parathyroid and its vascular supply, and remove every remnant of the thyroid. And I even bipolar, that tiny little bit of thyroid tissue that always lives in the tracheal wall. There's always a little bit inside the trachea we can't take out. <clears throat> and when people that are trained to leave that little remnant because it's an easier operation, and then they feel like if they give radioactive iodine, it might kill that small remnant. But we know radioactive iodine only kills microscopic disease. It doesn't really kill gross disease. It doesn't, gross disease means something you could see something you could see with your loop. So if you leave a centimeter of thyroid behind on both sides, 
And inside that are several three millimeter nodules of papillary thyroid cancer that have been left behind. The likelihood of radioactive iodine killing that is very, very small. <clears throat> so I'll give you a scenario of a patient I treated. He was from another state. He was a radiologist. During his radiology residency, he had a thyroidectomy for papillary thyroid, and they left a centimeter remnant behind. He underwent radioactive iodine. A year later, a nodule is noticed on his ultrasound. It's followed for five years. Uh, finally, it's growing, and his thyroglobulin is increasing, so he has a needle aspiration, and it shows papillary thyroid cancer. He came to see me just because uh, he was married to one of my resident sister. So he came up, we did an open exploration, and by now this one and a half centimeter papillary thyroid cancer from the remnant involved his recurrent laryngeal nerve and his esophageal wall. So I had to take out his recurrent laryngeal nerve and graft it with a graft. And I had to take off the wall of the esophagus and put a graft on it. Had this been taken out on the front end, this gentleman would have been spared vocal cord paralysis in this advanced operation. And we know now, because of this growth into the soft tissue, his survival is decreased over the usual 90 plus percent survival. Why do you think it was missed during the first surgery? And I want to highlight that the first surgery was not done at Vanderbilt. It wasn't missed. It's a technique that people use, and many people are taught to leave a small remnant of the thyroid behind. It is a, you don't have to find the recurrent laryngeal nerve if you do that. They say that it increases the chance of leaving blood supply of the superior parathyroid. But it's a way of teaching people to do thyroidectomies that's easier, but easy is not the right way to do most things, is it? Hmm. It's not this, so it's an inappropriate operation to leave a thyroid remnant behind. <clears throat> Many folks say, well, if we have a thyroid surgeon that's doing five or 10 thyroids a year, then maybe that's the way he should do it because it's safer. But the real answer to that, as you well know, is the surgeon that's doing five or 10 thyroids a year should not be doing thyroidectomy. Uh, so it's a, it's a, not a very good technique that often leaves disease behind. And the number is alarming. There's been guests on Dr. Thyroid that report that um, somewhere between maybe 80 and 90 percent of the thyroidectomies performed in the United States are done by surgeons who do fewer than 10 thyroidectomies a year. You know, it's very hard to really validate that data. But we do know that there are many surgeons in small communities, and they're wonderful people, and they are very well-meaning, good doctors, and their patients don't want to leave their community. They often know their doctor well, and they go to church with them and go to school functions with them, and so they desperately want that doctor to take out their thyroids. Mm -hmm. And it's just very, very hard to know how many of those doctors should go on and do thyroidectomies? Because probably a minority of their patients have a problem. How could we possibly select out that group that they shouldn't do and send to high volume centers? So I don't condemn these small volume surgeons as many of my colleagues do. I understand their plight. Uh, they're trying their best to do a good job in the community with the patients they want them to treat them. Has there been, <clears throat> not misleading, but has there been a error in messaging thyroid cancer, meaning even in regard to the surgeons out there who everyone's told thyroid cancer, thyroid surgery, it's just easy. It's not a big deal. It's the good cancer. Um, it's a very, maybe even on the physician's, and that's doing low volume, they're thinking, ah, the thyroidectomy, it's an easy one. And in some cases, there's a naive or ignorance toward just how complex a thyroidectomy can be in a more complex case. 
Well, I tell my young doctors I'm training all the time. You know, doing surgery, or I kid them, cutting someone's head off, someday will be the easiest thing you do. You know, raising kids is the hardest, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> the but knowing when and when not to operate and the extent of the operation is what's hard. So to stay right on the capsule of a thyroid gland, leave a remnant of thyroid behind, is not a technically challenging operation. But knowing how much further to go, how to carefully not injure the superior laryngeal nerves, how to carefully get away from that thyroid capsule and take out the disease that's in the paratracheal space and still preserve the superior laryngeal nerve, the cricothyroid muscle, so these folks, patients will have excellent you know, communication skills, how to save the vascular supply to the inferior parathyroid and the recurrent laryngeal nerve and still do the appropriately aggressive operation. That, that's what is hard. It's the judgment over and over to do the right thing. And so it is a, when you go beyond the thyroid and you take out the entire paratracheal space and you identify these structures, and you operate into the upper mediastinum and below the anominate artery, it is a very technically challenging operation. And if one is going to be a thyroid surgeon, probably it's wise to know how to do all aspects of these operations. You don't want your airline pilot to be really good 90% of the time, do you? Hmm. you I wouldn't get on an airplane with a gentleman that said, I can handle 90% of the problems while we're flying. And so you really want your surgeon to be able to handle the vast majority of simple and advanced cases when you go to sleep. You mentioned that remnant cancer or thyroid cancer that's left behind that sometimes it's done so by a surgeon if they're trying to preserve that recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now, what is the situation where the surgeon does damage the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, even cutting it, <clears throat> causing vocal cord paralysis, and still leaves cancer behind? How, how does that happen? <clears throat> well, again, that happens with inexperience. Uh, there are only a very few times that I leave thyroid cancer behind. One of those is if, a, if it's well-differentiated thyroid cancer and it is in, into the voice box, uh, and I know that even thyroid cancer in the voice box, if we give radioactive iodine, they will have a functioning larynx or voice box for at least 10 years after that before we might need to do a laryngectomy. So I would could buy a 50-year-old patient the use of their voice box for 10 more years without doing an aggressive laryngectomy just because thyroid cancer had grown into it at the first operation. <clears throat> I leave thyroid cancer behind when a longer than two centimeters, four, longer than four centimeters of the trachea is involved with cancer. Then we know we can't take out a 10 centimeter length of the trachea and put it back together. We leave thyroid cancer behind when it has grown deeply into the prevertebral fascia. Uh, but those are very, very rare instances in my practice of thousands and thousands of patients with thyroid cancer. So <clears throat> if you are appropriately aggressive and understand your anatomy, then it, you would rarely ever cut the recurrent laryngeal nerve and then have to leave thyroid cancer behind. Uh, I could see rarely it's involving the entire trachea. The nerve is hidden in cancer. You're desperately trying to follow it up and it gets injured. But most of the time, if we carefully follow the nerve, we can dissect the cancer off the nerve. The nerve is plastered over the surface and we can often gently dissect the nerve off of the lymph nodes that grow right under it. We can clear all the disease, even if we need to take some esophageal musculature or take some of the lower muscles of the larynx or just frequently taking the strap muscles, then, uh, you know, 98, 99% of the time we can clear all gross disease. And if the recurrent laryngeal nerve on one side is involved with cancer, 
it's obvious it's cancer, then we would resect that nerve and put a graft in it. And people have a remarkably good outcome from grafting their recurrent laryngeal nerve. Can the graft be done later on, uh, like even months or years <clears throat> later? Certainly, grafting at the time of the resection is by far the best. And I can give you a little bit of data. We looked at 20 of our patients that either someone else cut the nerve and immediately consulted us, and we went back in within the first week, or I had to remove the nerve for cancer. And if we did at the time of surgery or a couple of the patients were about a week later, if we went back in and put either an inline graft of a nerve grafting a two or three or four centimeter segment of nerve to line the recurrent back up, or at times we take the ends of cervicalis nerve or the ends of hypoglossy nerve, these are motor nerves to the muscles overlying the thyroid gland. If we take either one of these techniques and sew them back to the end of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, <clears throat> then what really occurs is the closing muscles of the larynx win. This one nerve to the recurrent, the one recurrent laryngeal nerve, as you and your most of our listeners know, opens the vocal cord when we breathe and closes the vocal cord when we speak. But the most important thing is it closes the vocal cords when we swallow. The life-sustaining function of vocal cords is to close when you swallow so that the food doesn't go in your lungs, it goes in your esophagus. So if I've got one nerve that has opening fibers that opens and other fibers that close, in this situation, we're very fortunate that if we graft a nerve, and we're not smart enough to line all these little fibers up just right, we can't see at that microscopic level. So we're sending motor function back into the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and thank goodness, the vocal cord, as it re innervates, the, the vocal cord drifts to the midline and becomes fixed and firm in the midline so that the mobile vocal cord can hit against it well. So we grafted 20 patients, and uh, none of those patients have vocal cord motion. But at the end of one year, 19 out of 20, their vocal cord was nicely in the midline and they had a near normal voice. Their swallowing was good. And, and they couldn't become professional singers, but their family said, this is the voice we remember. Mm. So it is very useful. Now, the second part of your question, how long later can we do it? Probably you could do it even years later if you needed to. Although the sooner we do it, it would be far better. Mm. We know that ner muscles that don't have a nerve going to them atrophy and after about a year sometimes they're not as receptive to the nerve graft in growth but we also know that somehow or another these vocal cords re a little bit it's even if we do if we don't do any surgical procedure about 95 percent of vocal cords that are paralyzed with no extra procedure if you put a needle electrode in they'll have some electrical function in the muscle so that tells me that probably, even if a patient comes to me two years later or three years later, it's an option to go back and graft the nerve. And sometimes for a patient, it might be a surprise they go in for a thyroidectomy at a, a given hospital, and they come out with a surprise being uh, a paralyzed vocal cord. And if we could just talk about the voice for a moment, you mentioned that professional singers, and this isn't um, anything new uh, or, or, or not honoring a patient's privacy, but of course, for example, Natalie Grant has been outspoken about her surgery with you and just thankful that her voice was preserved and she can continue singing. Let's talk about voice for a minute. Is a thyroid surgeon, what can be done to make sure a patient's voice is preserved? Well, there's, there's a couple of factors. And one is certainly the experience of the surgeon. And two is visualizing the structures around the superior laryngeal nerve, the cricothyroid muscle, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve 
and visualing around the, visualizing those structures very, very well. So we, our field in thyroid has gotten to be a little bit of marketing out there, as you can tell. <clears throat> People say my incision is smaller than your incision. I do, you know, minimally invasive surgery and all these terms, they really don't mean much. That, but you, in this situation, you want to make a reasonable incision of five centimeters, and that's still a very short thyroid incision, so that you can really see the structures well. I would not operate on a famous professional singer and try to do an endoscopic resection or a robotic resection of their thyroid gland. I want to see the structures very well. And, and many outcomes have shown that patients are equally happy and when they look in the mirror with their five or six centimeter incision as they are with their two centimeter incision. So make a big enough incision to see the structures well. <clears throat> the next step is we make a we we have a lot of rhetoric about protecting the superior laryngeal nerve. But then I see surgeons to grasp and bipolar and retract and push on the cricothyroid muscle. The cricothyroid muscles are these two delicate muscles right on the front of your voice box that go from your cricoid to your thyroid cartilage. And the superior laryngeal nerve comes down and innervates this muscle. And as this muscle tightens, your pitch gets higher. So that muscle is critical to a soprano opera singer's career. It's critical to a career like Natalie Grant, my wonderful patient. But most of us, it wouldn't bother us. We wouldn't have as much tonal inflection. But the key is to protect that muscle first, which is not spoken of much. And then to, as you dissect out the superior pole of the thyroid, meticulously look to see if you see the superior laryngeal nerve and where it's lying near the superior pole. Sometimes it is so high that as you carefully dissect on the superior pole of a benign thyroid, you don't actually see that nerve. And it's safe to not go and dissect out that nerve at that point. But if often the nerve is low enough, you see it and carefully protect it. So that helps the singing career more than anything right there. And then certainly monitoring the position of the recurrent laryngeal nerve carefully preserving it, bother, touching it as little as possible. All the while, we've got to get out the disease. My number one goal is to save these patients' life. And number two, hopefully they'll have an excellent voice, an excellent career, whatever they do after the surgery is over. How often is it where you see a patient and they come in, they, they get a pathology report that says, they have papillary thyroid cancer, and then they opt to not have surgery. <clears throat> you know, the vast majority of patients, 95 plus percent of patients, if they've told they have a cancer, and there's an operative approach to remove that cancer that won't alter their life, then patients will choose that operative approach. <clears throat> there are a few patients who maybe are irrational that may choose against that. And we can't, even with counseling of their family, sometimes we can't change that. And then now there is the very educated, thoughtful patient that's reading the literature closely and knowing that we can have this active surveillance that's quite safe in many patients now. And so a lovely person that may be the 30 year old female or a 50 year old female, it doesn't matter and they have a <clears throat> six millimeter nodule in the middle of their thyroid gland. It's not touching any edge. And most of us know the guidelines say, don't even evaluate that, just observe it. But if someone were to put a needle in that and draw it out and find it's papillary thyroid cancer, then the data would imply that that could be observed until it grows. And I have a few patients who are either listen to what we say or are well read enough to select the active surveillance. But that is very few at this point. Um, you know, as we wrap things up here, a, a couple final questions. One, um, after so many years of experience and after teaching so many, uh, really probably hundreds of patients, if you go back 
25 years to your younger self. <clears throat> and with all the experience you've gained over the years, what are some of the things you wish your younger self would have known as you look back? <clears throat> well, fortunately, you know, if we stay in a university setting or stay in it or even in a private practice, very well-read setting, I think either doctor can stay current. It's critical to stay current with the changes in what we do. Um, <clears throat> with our changes in ultrasound diagnosis, we, you know, we rarely do thyroid scans anymore. Uh, the pathway to evaluating and treating a thyroid is so much simpler now than it was when I was younger. Um, <clears throat> Even in my younger days, I would sit and listen to patients extensively to see what they wanted. Uh, and uh, that's what I try to teach my youngest doctors, that all the young trainees that I have, to listen to patients. Uh, I gave one lady a lecture about her nine millimeter nodule in her thyroid, and I gave her a 30 minute lecture on why that it was very safe to leave that behind. And, she put her hand on my knee and said, Dr. Nerville, that was an excellent lecture, but I've got a thyroid nodule in my neck and I want it out. <laughs> and so hmm. you need to learn to listen to patients uh, and tailor the care to each patient. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's the, the critical thing that I'm trying to teach my young colleagues. And then to stay up with the technology as it changes in our evaluation because we've wasted so much money evaluating thyroids over the years and operating on thyroids that didn't need to come out. And with the critical lack of healthcare dollars, we need to be good stewards of our thyroid patients and help to efficiently evaluate and follow them and do the right things for them. It is just critical to have a relationship with the patient that they trust you. Some doctors don't need that or don't want that, or they feel that that is a waste of time, that they are the surgeon and they tell the patient what to do. But we all know that the emotional health of a patient is critically important to them doing well. And if I spend a few extra minutes to chat with my patient about their, themselves, their lives, I tell them all, I'm going to ask you some personal questions. And first, you're going to think I'm nosy. That's what I tell each patient. And I say, but I'm not operating on a thyroid. I'm operating on a human. And I want to know more about you so that I can tailor your care to you and your family's needs. And it takes a while to listen to the patient to find out who they are and what their needs are. And then the relationship is remarkable the surgery, the surgery goes so well, the post-operative course goes so well, the post-operative communication needs are much, much less because the patient knows what's happening and they have confidence in their physician and in the, in the hospital that's caring for them. You, you mentioned, for example, you don't want to get on an airplane that's good 90% or the pilot is good 90% of the time. How can a patient check on the surgeon that they're considering for their thyroidectomy to really know how successful they are in performing thyroidectomies? You know, that is a very hard question because there's probably a number of thyroid surgeons out in the world there that do 10 thyroids a year who are exceptional surgeons and they do a great job and they may be better than some of the surgeons that do 100 thyroids a year. <clears throat> but that's impossible for the patient to know. So the, the only thing we can rely back on is that you'd like to find a doctor with a lot of experience. And the only way is to you know, ask that physician, you know, how many thyroids do you do? And it's sad that that's the original bit of information we have to seek and some people say if a doctor does less than 50 a year or if a doctor does less than 100 a year, uh, maybe you should try to find a doctor that has a busier thyroid practice. 
I think that now the, there is a lot of online data about each of us. And patients can type in our names and look up and just see what kind of publications have been produced by us and our institutions. And often there's a tremendous feedback online about whether patients like us or don't like us. It's still very, very hard for a patient to know this is a superb surgeon that's a, that I'm about to undergo surgery with. But those rough criteria of volume and reputation and publications may be the, really the only way that a patient can try to decide which surgeon to go to. What I often tell my patients, they come in scared to death. And they come in, you know, as a young mother with three little children or a young man that's just started this business or a grandmother or grandfathers that had their first grandchild and they desperately feel a responsibility to live and care for these very, very important people and and businesses in their life. And they're petrified. And it's a joy to hold their hand and talk to them and say, this is probably not going to take your life. This is now, instead of a cancer, that evil word cancer, this is a nuisance. And we're going to get you through this nuisance. And I often tell young mothers, and you're going to have to suffer through junior high kids. It's your plight in life. You're not going to get out of this. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the visit, you know, there's a, there's a smile in their heart. They feel somewhat contented. They think we're going to get through this. This is not going to radically alter my life. And so I, I wish I could give that sense of uh, well-being to all patients that are diagnosed with thyroid cancer up front, and it might make their journey through this a little better. Mm -hmm. So you, we could almost kiddingly say that having kids will dramatically alter someone's life more than thyroid cancer. There is no doubt about that. <laughs> Having had four wonderful children and now two wonderful grandchildren, it's a, uh, I can say that's true. This concludes today's interview. Thank you to Dr. Netterville. I'm honored to, I'm honored to be a part of your team. Thank you <laughs> for all the educational content that you provide for our, our many wonderful thyroid patients. I think that the online education is something they're seeking. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't read the encyclopedia anymore, do we? You know, patients get online and talk about us and say they like their doctor and their doctor did a good job. And so it is astounding how people are seeking their medical information. So for your efforts to try to provide good information online is extremely valuable to people. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Netterville. And thank you for sharing today's valuable information with the audience. For those listening, and for a complete list of show notes, you will find that on the Dr. Thyroid website. That's docthyroid.com. You will also find contact information for Dr. Netterville, including his mission to conduct surgical camps in Africa and links to his bio and his social media. Until next time, this is Philip James with Dr. Thyroid. If there's any health professional that you would like to hear from or a thyroid topic covered, please send me an email directly, and that's philipjames at docthyroid.com, and it's philip with one L.